just know every shot, you wanted it to be the last shot, you know. And, uh, and it would be quiet for a while, you know, and you'd hope that was it, but then he might go around and shoot some more. By hiding in a closet, Tracy Sanchez survived, living for the joy of cradling her newborn girl in her arms, marveling that both of them are survivors. Chelsea is nine weeks old, a balm to her mother's weary emotions. I needed something that, you know, something beautiful like her. August 20th is a day that still won't release Tracy. I have bad dreams still, just about every night. I'm just learning to live with it for a while, you know. Always glad to wake up, just relieved to wake up. Yeah. Tracy struggles against the fear that suddenly grips her in the most common of places because she knows too well that the ordinary isn't always safe. I still get nervous. I was in the grocery store the other day and some guy just looked at me wrong and I just began to think of how to get away, you know, get as far away from this guy. So yeah. Tracy still totes the mailbag of a letter carrier but is enjoying these weeks of maternity leave with her baby and six-year-old son, Robert, taking refuge in their love and contemplating the growth that has blossomed from tragedy. I learned that day that inside that room, well, I just really learned the importance of, of loving each other. You know, that just, uh, I just, uh, I mean, it, you know, when you're faced with the possibility of dying, you know, and this is how I, what I went through, and you know, and I thought you're going to die, and I questioned, are you going to go to heaven or hell? It was just panic, scattered. Everybody went in different directions, and he just started firing. Ron Blackwell is still walking the paces of a mailman, tracking the painful steps he took six months ago, one day after so many of his friends died. Ron started carrying the mail with his dad as a child, and it's his life's dream. But August 20th was a shattering awakening, and now he carries a heavier burden on his daily route. That's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Getting up and wondering if it was all a bad dream until you, when I realized you're going to have to go back down and, and stand in the same places that you were in six months ago when it happened. And... Oh, I hate to walk under that ladder. Ron doesn't trust his world the way he once did. You keep looking over your shoulder. I'm trying to put the past in the past, keep it there. And it's hard not to dwell on things that are constantly around you. There are so many people in the workforce that, that are having uh, problems that uh, you can't escape it if you wanted to. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Jeff. How are you doing? Good to see you. Nice to see you tomorrow. I'll be here. Okay. Ron and so many others still at work in the post office mourn all 15 who died in the bullets of August, including Pat Sherrill. They are plagued by why his fury exploded and sorry that fury couldn't be stopped before it reached Flashpoint. Tragedy at the post office struck deep into the heart of Edmund. The suffering of individuals became a community pain. This town mourned the physical and emotional destruction of each bullet fired that day. Then, it turned to face a change in itself. You can't walk in the post office without bringing back memories. <laughs> Edmond, Oklahoma is a quiet town. It's a place where family life flourishes. Its people are young, independent, gathered from all over the country to reap the bounty of the oil industry. It is affluent, proud of its schools. But that self-image of a small town where God is near and troubles are far away 
shattered in 1986. Edmund thought it knew grief when three people were brutally killed at the Winds IGA in the summer of 1985. Edmund thought it knew pain when a tornado blasted into the lives of more than 100 families last spring. And when a local businessman was unexplainably stabbed to death in his home, his fiance raped last summer, Edmund thought it knew shock. But on August 20th, Edmund finally understood what pain, grief, and shock could really mean. We all walk around feeling that, number one, we're invulnerable. We, you know, again, we know bad things happen, but not, not to us, to somebody else. Uh, and also that the world makes some kind of sense that, you know, that's comprehensible. And something as sense senseless as this, um, you know, shatters the, both of those assumptions. Edmund has come through the storms of disaster, still a peaceful place, with friendly people everywhere. You can still walk to the corner cafe and get a cup of coffee and a cheerful razzing from Pearl the waitress. But Pearl knows her little town is growing up. I used to live down here on South Broadway uh, when I first moved town, and I'd come to work and we'd go to bed at night, never lock a door or nothing. But boy, you don't dare to now. You just don't. Edmund realizes it's no longer too small to be immune from the problems of the world. It was a blasé attitude. I mean, that, that type of thing's not going to happen here. Not where we have the, the kind of attitudes about one another and the very proud community and such, and suddenly to be, to be humbled. And we were humbled. Uh, it, it brought everything to a point of, of saying, it happened here. And now, Edmund is discovering a new self-image. We look at our tragedies as a way of reflecting upon the maybe the inner person or the, or the inner community, just what kind of strength and what, just who we really are. Many, many people uh, in this community are now very much aware that we must pull together to help those who have needs in those areas. Uh, for we all know that we are not, any of us, very far removed from uh, having those needs ourselves. People are reporting crime more than they used to, even vandalism or whatever. I'm sure it's still all on the, you know, the back of people's minds, but is not, of course, naturally, it's not as prevalent, it's not, uh, it's not as uh, uh, strong as the, as the weeks and the days and the months go by. The echoes of a tragedy still resound in Edmund, but they sound with a hopeful blend of hurt and healing. Edmund Jane Braden, Pavlide News. For what you were doing last year when you first heard that 14 people had been gunned down in the Edmund Post Office. You may remember that the killer then killed himself. But then we all went on with our lives. But for the people closest to the massacre, this past year has seemed almost endless. New Center 2's Bill Shield was in Edmund last year and today and has this special report. Dawn this morning at the Edmund Post Office. A half-staffed flag guards two wreaths and a yellow ribbon. This year, there is peace here. But a year ago today, the sirens screamed, the SWAT men charged, and the paramedics raced to save victims. Part-time mailman Pat Sherrill had killed 14 co-workers. People were angry. You feel you're so mad, you feel like you'd like to walk over and shoot him a couple more times. Today I have no sympathy for him. I think he was a glory hunter who was out to make his name as the greatest mass murderer in history and was willing in order to do that to kill a lot of beautiful, wonderful people. I have no use for him. I have no feeling for him. For the families of the victims, one year later, anger has given way to overwhelming grief. The shock of the death of their loved ones has worn off, and what they're left coping with is the death. Hell. It's been hell. It's been terrible. Janet Esser is part of a support group for victims' relatives. It helps to share the pain. Judy Morey worked at the post office. She left minutes before the massacre. Judy lost 13 friends and her husband. Had we both died, that would be even more acceptable than me being left here without Kenny. 
On his route, Ron Blackwell wears the yellow ribbon, the symbol of caring for the victims. He deals with the pain on two fronts, personally and as head of the Postal Union. Blackwell says the post office made a mistake by trying to move the recovery at its speed rather than the victims. Uh, a lot of the problems uh, we had, people just didn't know they existed. And uh, as these are surface and we become aware of them, they were dealing with them head on. Today, guards and mounted patrols kept watch over the post office. The police have suffered too, often in obscurity. Lieutenant Richard Jones's SWAT team couldn't reach Cheryl before he'd finished killing. And Jones says many of his officers had never seen a massacre. Anytime you run onto a tragedy like this, it stays with you, sir. What stays with postal clerk Donna Ligon is the sympathy. When she feels low, she surrounds herself with the letters that have come in from all over the world. They help a lot. This, these things weren't something that was just, just put in all of the mail. These took work and time. They, were, they really mean a lot. There's an awful lot of caring here. And here is perhaps the best summary of Edmund's feelings for its victims one year later. From postal workers in Michigan, it says, these precious ones from us have gone. The voices we loved are stilled. A place is vacant in our hearts which can never be filled. After a lonely heartache, there remains a beautiful memory of those we love so dear. In Edmund Bill Shield, New Center 2. That's where we're headed first. Like most mailmen, Ron Blackwell spends the first part of his day sorting the post for his daily route, a nine-mile walk through downtown Edmond. I hit the street. But unlike almost any other postal worker, Ron has a partner. She's Sadie, the mail dog. Come here. Come here. You ready to go? Are you ready to go? About two years ago. Just by accident, I guess, one day she was out uh, running around and... And she started following me a few blocks, and then the next day she went a little further, and he got in the routine. Ron doesn't exactly own Sadie, but then again, neither does anyone else, really. Sadie has sort of adopted a large portion of what makes up Central Edmond. I have uh, the downtown business part of the route, uh, downtown Edmond, and about 500 residential deliveries. Howdy. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right? Come here, we gotta go. Every day, Sadie makes her rounds, walking the downtown streets, flaunting the local leash laws. But no one's ever complained. In fact, at many of her stops, Sadie picks up more than just the outgoing mail. Come get it. Say thank you. Uh, she doesn't hurt for treats, as you can tell. Well, that's, the, that's the fun of it, is seeing people's reaction and, and do a double take when they see a, a, a dog in uniform following a mailman instead of chasing him. And uh, just to watch their reaction and, and banner up and down the street, uh, it opens up doors. Yes, life couldn't be much sweeter for this seven-year-old mixed-breed basset. In or out of uniform, she's a walking, tail-wagging, public relations, and dog biscuit machine. There are no strangers to Sadie. They all know Sadie's name, whether they would know, they wouldn't recognize me if I had a name tag on, but uh, everybody pets Sadie and, and looks out for her. She's real popular. Let's go, let's go. It's an unlikely pairing, loose dog and mailman. But because of these two, the heart of Edmond may never be the same. Galen Culver, News Channel 4. Is this a great state or what?